Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon once again. My name is Nataki Osborne Jelks, and I am here to welcome you to Draw Down Georgia, an equitable framework for bringing climate solutions home. We have a very interesting evening or afternoon, I should say, planned for you today. Uh, let me just mention that we um, have both a live audience here um, as well as a live stream audience that will join us about 4.30 after we hear uh, from Reverend Durley, who is kind of the centerpiece for this afternoon. I will say, I, hopefully you saw the refreshments on the side. Uh, please feel free to grab some water uh, if you need to do that. Um, and we'll get started uh, with Dr. Durley's uh, remarks in just a few minutes, as well as um, the rest of the program. Today, we want to focus on, drawdown, on the Drawdown Georgia framework of climate solutions and centering equity as a priority. And that's something that is very important to me. Um, I am an environmental health scientist. I work at Spelman College uh, in the Environmental and Health Sciences Program. I also co-founded the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, which is a community-based organization uh, that has been working for a number of years to advance issues around environmental justice. And for that, uh, for us, that means um, that it's inclusive of climate justice. Um, and so as we think about equity, we think about issues around public health, we think about communities that have been made to be most vulnerable to climate change, uh, and we think about those communities, our communities of color, low-income communities uh, in our state and throughout this country, um, and we think about this in the context of climate change, um, we're all impacted. Uh, climate change uh, is something that is impacting and will continue to impact all of us uh, from Georgia uh, to the global stage. But even though we're in the same storm, we don't always find ourselves in the same boat, meaning that some communities are more vulnerable. Um, when we think about the communities that are most uh, impacted by exposure to environmental toxicants and hazards, including air pollution, um, we're talking about those communities who are most vulnerable. Just recently, there was a study uh, published that covered a number of cities throughout the United States, and Atlanta was one of those cities. And it talked about the legacy of red line communities um, and the fact that there is more air pollution in many of these red line communities across the country. Atlanta was no different. There have also been a number of studies that have looked at the issue of extreme heat. Uh, and again, Atlanta is one of those cities um, that has been identified as a place where those communities who have been made to be most vulnerable because of policy decisions that have shaped our communities, um, certain communities are more vulnerable um, to exposure to extreme heat. We can talk about energy burden. We can go down a list of things and find that those same communities are disproportionately impacted. So when we talk about uh, solutions for climate change, we cannot just talk about those technical solutions, um, but we've got to talk about root causes. We've got to talk about issues around equity. And if we're going to talk about equity, we have to talk about the very real challenge of racism in this country. And as we have this conversation this afternoon, um, Reverend Durley will illuminate our minds um, and he's kind of looking around uh, like I'm not talking about him, but, but he knows uh, what, what he's going to come and do. Uh, he's going to illuminate our minds. He's going to inspire us, um, as he does every time I see him, every time I hear him speak. Um, and he's going to talk about his journey and how he's sort of tied in work on climate change and climate justice uh, into this lifelong ministry that he has been advancing. We'll also hear from John Lanier, who is the executive director of the Racy Anderson Foundation, and my very good friend, um, Nathaniel Smith, who is the uh, chief equity officer for Partnership for Southern Equity. And uh, we go back to college. Uh, he was just remarking that um, I perhaps have been working on issues around environment for a little bit longer than he has. But when I think about the time that I've spent in Atlanta now, you know, uh, close to 30 years I've been here. Um, it was Nathaniel who introduced me to a lot of our local civil rights legends and heroes. I mean, and these are actually international heroes, but they just happen to be here in Atlanta. Um, and as we were students at Spelman and Morehouse Colleges, um, he introduced me to this circle that has been a part of his extended family 
uh, for a long time as someone who grew up in this area. So I'm pleased to kind of share this stage with uh, all of these individuals on today. So just a reminder that we'll be, we will be live streaming this conversation beginning approximately at 4.30. Um, and this is a part of the Living Future 2022, uh, 2022 conference. And to give you a little bit of context on this online community that we're interacting with today, Living Future 2022 is the annual conference of the International Living Future Institute, which is a global nonprofit organization that inspires the greenest buildings for a healthy world. The Institute's mission is to advance communities that are socially just, culturally rich, and ecologically restorative. You might be familiar with the Institute's Living Building Challenge, the world's most ambitious, advanced, and holistic performance standard for green, resilient, and healthy buildings. Um, we have a groundbreaking living building here in Atlanta, um, the Candida Living Building, um, which is on the Georgia Tech campus. The International Living Future Institute is also a hub for many other visionary programs that support the transformation toward and promoting a compelling vision for a, for a living future accessible to all. This year's conference theme is restoration and justice, which makes our conversation today particularly relevant um, for this global audience. Um, so we'll be streaming from 4.30 until 5.30 p.m. There will be an opportunity to ask questions following uh, John Lanier and Nathaniel Smith's conversation, and I'll come back up to help moderate those questions from you as well as from our live stream streaming audience. We've also set aside some time um, to continue the conversation with those of you who are here in person um, after the streaming session ends. Um, so again, help yourself to some beverages if you'd like. Um, but first, before we move into uh, the, the conversation between Nathaniel and John, I'd be honored to have uh, Reverend Dr. Gerald Durley join me at the podium after I give a brief bio. So Reverend Dr. Gerald L. Durley is Pastor Emeritus of the Historic Providence Missionary Baptist Church here in Atlanta. Uh, he is from Denver, Colorado. Uh, he joined the Civil Rights Movement in 1960 while attending Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. Upon graduation, he volunteered as one of the first Peace Corps members to serve in Nigeria. He subsequently completed a master's degree in community mental illness and psychology and served as an administrator and director of several programs at the university. Um, continuing his deep interest in civil and human rights, um, our speaker assumed the position of program manager at the U.S. Department of Education in Washington, D.C. He became vice president of the Institute uh, for Services to Education, uh, designing interdisciplinary study programs for historically black colleges and universities. He later enrolled at the University of Massachusetts, where he earned a doctorate degree in urban education and psychology. Um, Dr. Durley um, also earned a Master of Divinity um, at Howard University School of Divinity, and upon graduation, he became assistant pastor of Mount Olive Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. After he then locate, relocated to Atlanta, uh, he became a pulpit associate at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church while serving as dean of Clark College. He was called uh, to pastor Historic Providence Missionary Baptist Church in 1987, where he served for 25 years. Uh, during those monumental years, he concurrently directed the Morehouse School of Medicine's Health Promotion Resource Center and simultaneously served as, as the executive director of 19 Head Start sites. Reverend Dr. Durley is a legendary leader of civil and human, human rights causes, and in, in his recent years, he has become intensely active as an environmental warrior. He believes that God created the earth and gave us dominion over a perfect, ecologically balanced world, but humans are destroying this gift. He believes that we have a moral obligation and civic responsibility to speak up about climate change, global, global warming, and environmental justice. Reverend Durley combines the ethical teaching from the faith community with scientific research and his civil rights background to make a difference. And he's received a long list of awards, um, certificates of recognition, uh, and, and lots of appreciation from a number of leaders from across the country, including uh, former President uh, Barack Obama, uh, and he is currently chair, uh, national chair, um, for Interfaith Power and Light. He's chairperson of the board. 
Um, he's a sought after speaker, preacher, and presenter locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, and he believes that faith is the foundation upon which other traditions can establish their grounding. So, wow. <laughs> and, and there's more. We just don't have time to listen to it. Um, but you can, you can imagine, uh, and I know that most of us have heard of this outstanding uh, young man, I'll call him. His birthday is coming up. Um, but he has been a strong example and mentor to me. Uh, and to my husband, um, who is in the gospel ministry as well. And so without further ado, let me welcome to you Reverend Dr. Gerald L. Durley. What a great speech about me. <laughs> you know, there are times in all of our lives where we feel excited about being something if you're excited about the environment, if you're excited about what's before, somebody ought to just give a hand clap of praise. Somebody ought to be glad that you're here. Somebody ought to be, there is nothing worse than a bunch of dull environmentalists. <laughs> There's nothing worse than people talk about polar bears and trees and, and legislation and they, oh yeah, well I guess, no, this is our time, this is our moment. We are right now at the precipice of making a difference that's saving our environment and the planet. And I get excited about that. I remember, I never thought that I'd be standing here at the Carter Center. I've been here several times in the past with people uh, that I've known over the years, but never on occasion like this. This is so vitally significant. I think that in all of our lives, there are moments that change our lives. There are moments when you go to a theater expecting to see one thing or a play to see something, and something happens and it changes you. I never thought that I'd be standing here talking about climate change, tree huggers, uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the air, wildfires, tsunamis. Why? I'm concerned about civil and human rights. I'm concerned about what people are doing and the inequities and the, in the, in the inequalities of people's lives. But in all of our lives, there are certain moments where things just change. They just happen. That happened to me about 10 or 11 years ago. Here I was. Joining up in 1959 at Tennessee State, I was 18 years old. And that was another young kid that we got very close. He was 20. He was two years older than me, and he, he called me his little boy. His name was John Lewis. <clears throat> then there was an old man that used to talk to us. He was 34 years old, and what could he tell us? Who was C.T. Vivian? He just, but he was there with Dr. King, so we were there in 1959 in Nashville talking about civil rights and human rights and educational rights and the access to health care. These were constitutional rights for all Americans, and we were willing to do two things that I think we're going to have to do in the, civil, in the uh, <clears throat> climate change movement, and that is we were willing to sacrifice and we were willing to risk at any cost because we believed in it so much. But at 18 or 20, what do you know about anything? Yes, we fussed a lot of, we were fighting for equality, we were fighting for parity, but we didn't understand the concept of equity. We were talking about how do we make a difference? How do we march to my senior year, march into the March on Washington as a student leader in all of those days? There are things in your life that change you inextricably to make a difference, and you don't even know you're being changed. You're just kind of sitting there, and all of a sudden, something clicks. And I think that that's what happened to me <clears throat> after all of those years in the movement, in and out of jail, coming and going, and then leaving the country, going to Africa, and all of this. I was through with America, too racist for me. Institutional racism had been too much, and here I was. All I wanted to do was just become a great, fantastic, unbelievable basketball player. <laughs> yeah, then I could do it. But that didn't go that well. Came back and did quite a few things, as Dr. Jelks talked about. But then one day, about 15 years ago, a lady came to me here in Atlanta. A white lady came and said, I'd like to talk to you about teenage pregnancy in the city of Georgia. Young black girls, and Nathaniel Smith talks about equity, about how everybody, regardless of the color of the background, can talk about equity. And this lady came up to me, and I wonder why would a white woman come up to me to tell me about black girls and teenage pregnancy? I've got other things on my agenda. So we went out to the airport, and there was about 60 pastors there, all white, and they were talking about, we've got to do some things around equality among teenage pregnancy black girls here in the city of Atlanta. We got to look at the equity and how do we make it fair and just. 
And I sat there. I said, well, I'll ride out to the airport with you and meet with the, all of these pastors from all over the country. And uh, interestingly enough, there are certain times in your life where things make a change, where you come expecting one thing and something else happens. And what happened? She got up and was talking about teenage pregnancy. And so they said, who is that guy standing there? And I saw they were pointing toward me. Is he your bodyguard? <laughs> Stereotype. Why would, I say, why would I be a bodyguard? I said, no. So they asked me, they said, if you're going to speak, do you have a PowerPoint? PowerPoint, you know. I'm a, <laughs> if you're going to speak. So I said, yes. So I got up like I got up now. And the guy said, do you have your PowerPoint? And then I said, I'm pointing to my power right now. It never goes out. And I went on. She said, I'd like you to meet my husband. That lady's name was Jane Fonda. Her husband was Ted Turner. The next thing I was with Sally Bingham and all the people talking about these kinds of things. And I began to understand that the environmental movement and the civil rights movement were primarily the same issue. We were fighting for constitutional rights that had already been put in place. We were fighting for voting rights, educational rights, access to health care. But we faced the same kind of challenges that the environmental movement faced. We did not have any political allies. We were underfunded. We didn't know exactly what we would do. We didn't have a national headquarters. But we had one thing on our side, and I think we have that same thing on our side of those of you in this room today. We had justice on our side. We had right on our side. We had moral and ethical positions on our side, and we were willing to do two things, sacrifice and risk. I tell people now, if you're not willing to sacrifice no risk, go home. Don't stand around me uh, just saying, well, I think I'm going to do it, and you're not willing to sacrifice so I got involved in the movement and began to meet people and began to understand the connection to mean that we all have a constitutional right to clean air, to clean water, to have the right to live in a community where we began to change our lifestyle but still keep what God said was a perfectly balanced ecological world that we're destroying because of our profits over people. What are we willing to stand up for? So I was invited out to uh, New Mexico to speak to a large group of philanthropists well, really, I wasn't speaking. I was just kind of a tag along. And uh, I was there. Three days of great meetings, wonderful meetings. And they talked and they talked and about they were philanthropists with money from all over, Ford Foundation, uh, all of these organizations. So at the end, at the closing, they said, Dr. Durley, what did you think about what you've heard today in the last several days? And I believe in being honest. <clears throat> and uh, I said, uh, I thought that this was some of the most intelligent people I've ever seen. The scientific data was so sterling. The money that you have is great. The way that you can pull conferences together out here in New Mexico is profound. But my assessment was that <clears throat> you're the dullest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> you keep saying the same thing, getting the same results. You come, you go to one meeting to another meeting, rather than understanding that we've got to get down to the crux and understand the inequities that are being perpetrated by people that did not pollute as much as other communities. You talked above that. You kept funding the same people that were doing the same thing and wondered we'd get different results. You can imagine the same way that you're looking at me now, they looked at me then. And then there was a loud applause. So when we talk about equality, when we talk about equity, we've got to understand the difference between the two and our panelists today. We thank Drawdown Georgia for allowing them to come. Because it's one thing to be equal, but it's another thing for equality. Don't just say, I'm going to give everybody the same thing and then change the rules and suppress voting and other kinds of issues. Equity. We didn't think about equity. We talked about parity and equality, but now equity. And so I think I applaud the Ray Anderson company coming together with these two, with John and with Nathaniel, to talk about equity. What good is it for you to say you've got equal access and then you cut off my legs and you turn it around? This is what equity is about. This is why it's so important. And I'm taking that same energy that we had 62 years ago. In fact, some of them are asking, how can you be so excited? My birthday is May 11th. I'll be 80 years old, and I don't feel no way tired. I feel like running on. I feel, and that's the enthusiasm. That's the strength when John Lewis and CT and Martin and all, and Jesse and everybody, you've got to have that enthusiasm. They will explain it, but what good is it? This is not a Frankenstein movie. When you leave, don't be frightened in the movie house and go out and say it's all over. This is not an end. This is a beginning. So I want to compliment this great group today to say that this is your time. This is your moment. Do not bend. Do not back up. Do not bow. But always stay on the cutting edge. Remember this that this is the time now and none of us will survive
unless we all survive. So I'm saying to you, John, and to you, Nathaniel, the future is uncertain. The end is always near, but the beginning is now. Take us home, brothers. <laughs>
to intervene in this space. We didn't know what the most significant impact that we could make in this space would be. So we looked for inspiration. What has been that which has inspired us in the climate space? And it was the work of Project Drawdown. At that time, they were about to release a book that was going to list the 100 most substantive solutions to the climate crisis. And what we came to as our conversations continued, what we came to appreciate was that they were focused on solutions, not just explaining how dire of a challenge we're facing, but how much we can do today, right now, to address it and to solve it. But there's one thing that Project Drawdown couldn't do with their list of solutions. They could not tell us, a family foundation in Atlanta, Georgia, what climate solutions work best in our community. We're the size foundation that feels like we can make the biggest impact here. We don't want to be a drop in the bucket of international philanthropy on this issue. We'd rather make a difference in our community and, and be a part of those who are already doing this work. So what would be the most impactful climate solutions for the state of Georgia? That was the fundamental question. Well, to answer a question like that, I believe you've got to do some research. Turns out I'm not the person to do that research. But we have this amazing wealth of talent within the state of Georgia. There are multiple professionals within the many universities in Georgia who have dedicated their careers to understanding our climate and have a deep understanding of what we can do to help bring it back into balance. And so in conversation with a number of them, we realized there was an opportunity to regionalize the work of Project Drawdown, to do what they did for the globe and do it for Georgia, analyze what climate solutions work best, which ones can do the most to reduce the state of Georgia's carbon footprint. And critically, to identify solutions against that one metric and many other critically important ones. Things like equity, what we're here to lift up today. What climate solutions can do the most to solve the problems of inequity in our society? What climate solutions can do the most to advance human health? Which ones can do the most to provide meaningful economic opportunities, new jobs, hopefully jobs that invite those who have long been left out of the conversation to benefit from them? And what are the opportunities to enrich our natural environment as well? This was the charge of the research team spanning Georgia Tech, the University of Georgia, Emory University, and Georgia State. And after more than a year of working to identify these solutions, they provided a list of 20 high impact climate solutions for the state of Georgia with a detailed understanding of these other considerations that often matter more to people than the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It was a tremendous research project. But it's not just about the research. That is the backbone of the work around which we need to build a movement in favor of scaling these climate solutions. And so that is the work ahead. And I'm going to speak to what that will be in just a moment. But I wanted to take this point in my remarks to speak to some of the learnings that I've had as a part of the philanthropic sector focused on climate solutions. Because while the research was ongoing, I came to realize just how much more I needed to learn about the racial injustice and the inequities that continue to plague our society. When George Floyd was murdered, it was a moment of awakening for me as a white man of privilege. I remember desperately looking for guidance from people who I trusted on how to make sense of that tragedy. Nathaniel was one of those people, and the Partnership for Southern Equity was at the forefront of making sense of this senseless act. And I was so grateful to have a teacher like him, 
to have teachers like Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelks and Reverend Durley, people who can help me make sense of something that is fundamentally not a part of my lived experience. So I spent time reflecting then and have continued to do so, reflecting on what we're trying to do at the Ray C. Anderson Foundation in this space, reflecting on how we can continue to do better in centering equity in our work. And so there were three things that I realized in those reflections. Three things that I want to share with you here today. The first is that I am incredibly proud of the diversity of the research team that generated this best-in-class climate research. But I have to acknowledge that just because it was great doesn't mean it could not have been better. There was an opportunity missed by our foundation at the very beginning of Drawdown Georgia to welcome other institutions into that work, and we did not take it. And for that, I am sorry and regretful because there are other institutions, HBCUs in our state that could have added even more to the work that was done. And I'm so grateful that they are in this work now, and we need to find ways to continue to deepen it. And so what I realize is that diversity doesn't just exist at the level of the individual. It also exists at the level of the institutions that you have at the table. There are multiple tables where we need to be mindful about who is being invited to not only have a seat, but have a voice. The second thing that I realized in reflecting on where we are in this space, my grandfather was fond of a phrase, status quo is a powerful opiate. Now for him, he was talking about the business world and how slow it had been to embrace a new way of doing business that was mindful of the impact it was having on the environment. But I think that phrase exists and applies outside of the context of just business. Because when we talk about racial injustice, status quo is a powerful opiate. And what does that mean for me? Well, before the mur murder of George Floyd, I think I would have, if I was honest with you, I would have said, well, I'm not contributing to the injustices. Admittedly, I may not be proactively trying to solve our equity challenges, but at least I'm not a part of the problem. And it turns out I don't think that's enough. It's not enough to say I'm not a bad guy. I have to proactively choose to be one of the good guys to sit there on the sidelines and watch the work being done without finding your place on the field is no longer acceptable when we face the challenges we face now and will continue to face. And so I feel a need to do more to get into this space more proactively in our work and as an individual. The third thing that I've come to realize in this space is a deeper understanding of what urgency really means. Urgency in climate, for me, has long meant making sure we take the actions now so that we don't see climate change spiral terribly out of control. For people who've heard me speak on climate before, there's something I often say, and I'll say it again now. I did the math. My son will turn 84, and my daughter will turn 82 at the end of the century there's a good chance that they will live to see every day of this century. And I'm motivated by making sure that the world they grow old in is as rich and vibrant and just as possible. But here's my realization. What privilege to worry about the life my children will have when they're in their 80s. How fortunate I am that I get to only worry about their challenges in the future when so many people are facing challenges across the spectrum of issues, but in climate too, today, people are wrestling with that now. My intentions for my children are good, but I can't focus just on that. I have to accept the fact that others struggle more than I do and more than my family does. And so we have an opportunity to address those things. So those are my learnings, and more are still to come in this space, I have a life ahead of me of learning about these issues. But now I want to tell you a bit about what's coming with Drawdown Georgia. As I said, 
we have this research backbone, but we need people to pick it up, to do something with it. We're grateful for the role that so many people have played in this space, and ultimately, we need to lift up those who are the experts. We need to lift up the Nathaniel Smiths and the Partnership for Southern Equity, who've been doing this work for a long time, and many other outstanding organizations, so that the right messengers are bringing the message of climate solutions to their audiences. That's the idea behind much of what we're trying to do. We're trying to breathe life into initiatives underneath this Drawdown Georgia umbrella that can make the solutions relevant to whatever stakeholder group there is. Let me give you a few examples of what's happened to date and then share an exciting one that's about to be coming. We're excited that Georgia Interfaith Power and Light has taken on the work of bringing Drawdown Georgia solutions to congregations. They are the best situated to speak to people of faith across the state about why these lists of climate solutions matter to them. So we want them to be the messengers. Similarly, we have the Draw Drawdown Georgia for Higher Education, where the Georgia Climate Project is making the solutions relevant to the campuses and institutions of the universities that are part of the Georgia Climate Project. They are the best people to be the messengers in that space. And most recently in the fall, I was thrilled by the announcement of the Drawdown Georgia Business Compact, mm -hmm. led by our friends at the Ray C. Anderson Center for Sustainable Business at Georgia Tech. They are taking these climate solutions and making them relevant to businesses in our state, from small businesses with their entire operations here to Fortune 100 companies headquartered here, building a community of practice around doing the work of scaling climate solutions, not just making corporate climate commitments. To me, it's an exciting example of bringing solutions home, localizing them so that the work is easier to do as part of a community. Here's the new one. When we talk about groups that come together in this space in climate, there's an opportunity that we at the Ray C. Anderson Foundation are mindful of. Can we bring the philanthropic community together as well around climate solutions. And so I get to make an announcement today that yes, we have and we will be doing that. We're thrilled to be standing next to the Candida Fund, the Dobbs Foundation, and the Sapelo Foundation to do a joint RFP for equitable climate solutions. The idea behind this is can we come together with our resources and provide opportunities for grants to organizations based in community across our state to help them bring climate solutions to their communities? We're mindful of the fact that so many communities lack the resources to be able to engage in the work of climate where they are. So many solutions that we know work but have barriers to entry that often Things like philanthropic capital can help to bring down. That's the idea behind this. And so by the end of the year, we will be making at least four $100,000 grants across our various institutions in support of this work. We want it to go statewide in Georgia to make a difference in place in these communities. And equity will be at the core of that. And for anybody that's interested in this opportunity, we're announcing it today. And there's a website now going live with information for people to follow along, whether people connected to the sort of organization that could benefit from the grants, or perhaps someone is with a philanthropic organization who may be interested in joining us in this work. I invite you to go to drawdownga.org grants to learn more about this opportunity. Our hope is that by finding so many opportunities to show how climate solutions matter within our state and how coming together and collaborating is the most important way to move forward, we can make a difference not only on the issue of climate and the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, but make a difference in the lives of the people who we risk leaving behind if we don't make sure that we center justice and equity at the heart of our climate work. And there is no one I know who's better situated to speak about that intersectionality than Nathaniel Smith, 
the Chief Equity Officer of the Partnership for Southern Equity. I turn it over to you, my oh, friend. Oh, my goodness, John. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I can listen to John all day talk about <laughs> equity, right? It's a, a, a great thing to behold. I, I tell you, it has been a, a long and beautiful journey of learning. You know, I always tell my friends that equity is both a journey and a destination. Um, it is both. And if you take the time to smell the roses along the way, um, you will have an opportunity to be not only a better leader, uh, but a better human being. Um, I also, I would be remiss um, if I did not take the time to honor uh, Reverend Durley uh, for his leadership for so many years when he was in many ways the voice crying in the wilderness on both sides of the discussion. One, uh, to try to get the more established sustainability organizations to see black folks, right, and to see us as partners in realizing a more sustainable and resilient world, and in the black community as well. Um, to get them to understand that as our climate continues to change, that we will be on the shortest end of that stick as we continue to um, face the challenges that we're facing um, as a human family. But we also have to realize that for some communities they get a cold when it comes down to climate challenges, other communities will get pneumonia. Um, and that is because of history, it is because of many of the challenges that we're facing. And then, of course, my sister, uh, Nataki Osborne Jelps, Dr. Jelps. Um, we've known each other since our Morehouse and Spelman days, uh, trying to figure it out. But I'm always the first person to say that she figured it out before I did. And, um, and I've been really following behind her um, ever since our time at Morehouse and Spelman. Um, and so I just want to take the time to give you your flowers and honor you for just being such a great leader and friend and my sister in this work. So I won't tear it too far, but I do have some things that may make you feel uncomfortable, but I don't care. <laughs> um, and I think that because of the urgency of where we are in the world, um, we have to get a little bit uncomfortable. Um, we also need to get uncomfortable because we're sitting in the place that in many ways has been ground zero for extreme extraction, the American South. A place that before we truly utilize fossil fuels for our energy to advance our extractive economy, we use the power of free labor, indentured servitude and slavery as the primary way that we move forward as an economy. And the ripple effect of that history of structural injustice and white oppression continues to not only affect our most vulnerable communities, but also our planet. Structural inequity and climate injustice are cousins. Whether you want to understand it or not, both come from the same place, a place of extreme extraction, a place of injustice, and even more so, a place of inhumanity. And we have to be willing to stand up and not be afraid to speak that truth. We will never have a more just and sustainable society without liberation. We must work to ensure that all people are not just in a clean environment, but are free free to experience the beauty of this world, freedom to have an opportunity to reach their full potential, free to make friends, free to go to uncommon places and learn and explore. So when we talk about this work and this connection between our climate and equity, yes, it's about making sure that we're good stewards of this planet but are we really able to understand that we're all connected? You know, we live in a place that created and provided an environment for one of the most incredible profits that we've ever experienced in this nation to live and grow and prosper 
and that was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not too far from him here, he lived as a young man on Auburn Avenue. And he used to talk a great bit about what he called the network of mutuality. That we live in this network of mutuality and that we are bound by this single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects us all indirectly. You cannot focus on what is happening to our wildlife without also caring about what's happening to the people who live in the homes in Vine City and English Avenue who have to choose every day between paying the light bill or buying groceries. You cannot worry about what happened at COP26 and whether we'll be able to lower and work together to lower our carbon emissions when every day children can't breathe who live next to 2A to 5 and 20. We cannot talk about the beauty of parks and green space and its importance in climate remediation strategies while at the same time understanding that some of the people who live in Westside Park in Atlanta are afraid because they understand that their property values will increase and they may not be able to benefit from the beautiful park that they spent their public money to develop. In essence, positioning them to subsidize their own displacement. So we will never realize the world that we need for ourselves if we're willing to turn away and believe that only a small percentage of our communities deserve to live in a beautiful environment or live in an environment that's healthy and sustainable. We will never realize a truly sustainable world, a truly resilient world, if, it's an, if it is not a just world. So at the Partnership for Southern Equity, that is our focus, focusing on ensuring that as we move towards freedom, through the context of our planet and our communities, that we will always ensure that our compass is equity. That while we're searching for that end, where all people in our planet will be loved and embraced and supported, that we will make sure we get there because we will be centered and grounded by this commitment to just and fair inclusion. Without a compass, you can't get to the proper destination. And we believe that equity is that destination. Why? Because equity is not equality. And the greatest difference between equity and equality is history. You can't talk about where you want to go if you're not willing to repair and heal the past. You can't talk about having a more resilient future without understanding that there is nothing you can tell a woman that lives in southwest Atlanta who is trying to feed her family on minimum wage and still be in a position to pay her light bill about resilience. I will say that again because I don't think you heard me. There is nothing anyone in this room that could tell a mother raising three kids who is trying her best to make sure that they can reach their full potential in spite of the many structural challenges that she's facing every day about resilience. We believe at the Partnership for Southern Equity that the people that are closest to the problem are actually closest to the solution. It is our responsibility to not be missionaries It is our responsibility to make sure that people have their own agency cultivated and supported in a way where their commitment and vision for a better world will be realized, not yours. And why should you do that? Because if you say that you're committed to equity, that is the only way. Equity is not about what you're willing to give. And I've talked to John about this, and I'm really excited about the
the role of philanthropy in moving this work forward and them expending their philanthropic dollars. God knows we need it, especially the frontline organizations that we support and love every day, the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, EcoAction, and other statewide organizations that we work with around the state of Georgia. But it's not exclusively about what you're willing to give that will realize equity. It's about what you're willing to give up. What are you willing to give up for equity? Are you willing to give up your privilege? Are you willing to give up your perceptions about certain communities? Let's be clear, when we talk about beyond carbon, let's talk about why we don't have a regional transit system in this city and in this region. Let's talk about why we've been trying for so long, Pastor Durley, to move beyond Fulton County and the city of Atlanta and DeKalb. And the organization that I lead, we were able to expand Marta and Clayton for the first time in 40 years. But let's talk about why we can't get to Gwinnett County or why we can't get to Cobb or other counties. It's not because of the color of the buses. It's because of the perceived notions that certain communities have about certain people who ride those buses. And because of that, because of that fear and ignorance, we all sit in traffic. I have never sat, Nataki, in black traffic in my life, <laughs> or white traffic, or Latino traffic. We all sit in traffic. So the work of equity is not just about communities of color and black communities, it's about all of us. Because even though communities of color have been hurt and harmed by decisions that have been made by certain segments of the community, those people have been harmed as well. You just can't see it or understand it. Because it's disconnected you from humanity and from our planet. So the work is not just about policy change. It's about how do we transform people in ways that they will be able to see themselves and other people, John, that they usually don't sit with and talk to a lot, even though those are the people that hold our future in their hands. You know, I sit in these many, envir these many environmental conversations and everybody continues to pat themselves on the back about the same accomplishment over and over and over again. We've got to bring new people to the table, but we've got to make sure that they understand the value proposition in their engagement in the work. That is why PSC is a multi-issue organization. You can't talk about climate and not talk about health. You can't talk about health without talking about economic inclusion. You can't talk about economic inclusion without talking about growth. That is the way that we must engage communities that have been marginalized because of this history of structural inequity in order to get them involved in the work we're doing. The people that we serve and the people that John and I are talking about don't have a light bill problem on Monday and a jobs problem on Tuesday and an education problem on Wednesday. They have those problems every day. So we must find ways to connect the dots. And while at the same time we're working to connect the dots, we must connect our hearts to the work and to their livelihood. It's not just about the hard work, people. It's about the heart work. What are you willing to give up? And is it time now for our environmental community to be courageous enough to care? because it will take courage for us to move this work forward. And let's not get it twisted. There is a backlash coming. And that is why I have a great deal of respect for John and others who understand that. Equity is cool right now. It's a cool thing. You know, it's the new coconut water right now. Right? Everybody wants to talk about equity. Everybody wants a racial equity plan. Everybody's still in my staff. <laughs> you didn't catch that. 
because they want to be a part of this conversation. But what happens when the legislature begins to do certain things that affect your bottom line or the people that you care about? Are you willing to stand for racial equity then? You know, when we were fighting for equitable, a more equitable democracy in this state, and many of the corporations were silent, I wrote an op-ed and I asked one question. How can you say you love black people and not love black democracy? It's either or. Either you love justice or you don't. You, don't. you can't love justice a little bit when it's convenient. You can't be for equity on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You gotta be for it every day. So we're at this moment where we have to understand all of these things and understand that moving down a road of equality is not gonna get us to a more resilient world. We have to begin to understand our past and begin to work towards ensuring that all people have what they need in order to realize their full potential. So it's not just about transitioning towards a clean energy economy. It's about making sure that as we transition, we don't leave anybody behind or replace it with one unjust economy with another, or place one unjust economy with another. It's about making sure that when we talk about solarizing communities, that we're not positioning that solarization as a way to drive displacement and gentrification. And also, are we working to ensure that folks are actually trained and positioned to benefit from the new technology that is coming from the supply side and not just the demand side? You know, are we working to ensure that when conversations are happening around energy policy, that we're not just inviting Pastor Durley communities of color to just show their faces so you can make it seem as if your fight is diverse. But when it's time to actually sit at the table and have real conversations about sharing the grant money that you got to get those folks there, it becomes a different conversation. I always tell my frontline friends that if any big green is having a conversation with you, if you can't see it in the budget as a line item, then it's not real. So there's some real, there's a reckoning that we have to have as a community. And it's not just about the polluters. It's not just about the quote unquote bad guy. What do we need to clean up in our environmental family? What are the things that we have to do to make sure that we're moving forward together in a more just and inclusive way? How can we begin to live our sermon and begin to show the other side that we're so serious about this work around realizing a more sustainable and resilient world that we're not willing to leave anybody behind. And we're gonna do all we can to ensure that everybody is positioned to not only reach their full potential within, within the context of our changing climate towards a clean energy economy, but we will have a more just society that is not just focused on new technologies, but a new way of being. That is what we need right now. We don't just need new solar. We need new values. So I will stop there. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to the Q&A. You know, I'm, I'm just so pleased and full to see so many people who've decided to hear John and I, I guess, talk about things. You know, I'm really excited about Drawdown. I have to say that as well. You know, being one of the um, tri-chairs of Drawdown. I mean, John knew exactly what he was getting with me. Indeed. And, and we had a really authentic conversation about um, what this had to be. And he has come through every time. And so I appreciate that, not only for me, but again, you know, for the people who don't have the time or the convenience to sit in rooms like this and have this conversation. Those are the people that I fight for every day. Um, and I hope that you will choose to fight for them too. 
and be a part of this movement that we're working to create. Um, so I'll stop there, John. Thank you. so much uh, for that um, really enlightening uh, exchange. Now we are gonna um, open the floor up for some questions and answers. Um, I'll start with a question to each, uh, John and to Nathaniel, and I believe we will have um, some questions hopefully coming from the live stream as well, and so I'll take some direction on uh, what those questions might be uh, in terms of, of getting some help um, to get those questions to the forefront. But let me ask a question uh, to each of you first. So um, to Nathaniel, and I think you, you've started, you laid out quite a bit um, for us to think about. Um, but I want to ask you to be maybe a little bit more specific in terms of certain communities. Um, and, and John has talked about what he is doing with other uh, local and statewide funders in terms of the philanthropic space. Um, but what else do you see as critical for uh, the funding community. Um, you talked about um, you know, knowing that the communities that are facing the problems are oft oftentimes those who are closest to the solutions. Um, I will just elevate um, that Partnership for Southern Equity is not, um, it's not the typical organization because they are working on behalf of frontline organizations. They're not a traditional funder, but they have pool their resources um, to turn around and to give grants to frontline groups, um, really stepping in into a space in which there has been a void, um, especially with respect to a lot of the issues that were raised today. And so if Partnership for Southern Equity can do that and help to fill That's this right. void, um, being a group that is not a traditional funder, what do you say to the philanthropic community? Can you give us some concrete things that we need that community to do um, to help us to advance equity specifically uh, in this space around climate solutions? That's great, Taki. So a couple of things. One, it is very important. You know, one of the first things that I said to you all is that we must remove the missionary, the culture and, uh, of, of, of a missionary mentality in how we engage frontline communities and black communities and historically disinvested communities of color. We have to invest in leadership development, right? We've got to invest in cultivating the agency of the people on the ground in order for them to understand what is happening and to have real clarity around not only what the solutions are in terms of what they read, but through their own experience and their own genius, what can those solutions potentially be? So I would say leadership development is key. The other key thing that we're learning is, is that while we talk about solar, 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 clean energy, clean energy, clean energy, when we look in a room of the people that are doing solar or look in a room doing this clean energy technology, it's just like this room. So we have to make sure that we're ensuring a level of inclusion, economic inclusion. You know, we, we talk about the demand side of this discussion, but black folks and communities of color need to be on the supply side as well. They need to be the new entrepreneurs. They need to be trained and cultivated, right? So this work around that is gonna be really important, workforce development. And then the other thing that I think is really, really important is, how can we play a role in jump-starting the clean energy economy by way of retrofitting uh, many of the communities that have been disinvested in? So moving from a culture of just sustainability and resilience to a culture of repair and healing. And I think if we lead with repair and healing within the context of sustainability, there are a lot of opportunities like our historically black colleges and universities. Many of them can be weatherized and retrofitted, which can create a, a clean energy revolution in those communities. Many of the communities that have been disinvested due to redlining and other key things can really benefit from a more targeted approach around energy efficiency and retrofitting, and also solarizing and, and using other forms of clean energy technology. So being laser-like and, and, and leveraging this moment as a way to encourage a clean energy transition, Ataki, while at the same time working with those communities in ways that will position them to lead and not just follow. 
I think of those, those are three easy things I think that we can start and do, you know. Thank you so much for that. And I appreciate you talking about leading with repair and healing. Um, my criticism, a lot of what, what I see from my vantage point, um, you know, as a city, as a region, we invest a lot in the new and shiny. You know, what new thing can we start? What new, you know, building? What new initiative? Um, and sometimes that which, which remains that has been underinvested in um, just gets overlooked. Uh, so I, I appreciate you talking about this, the potential in retrofitting uh, and leading with repair and healing. And so for John, my question to you um, really is about this uh, venture that you, that you just announced. Uh, you're partnering with other uh, foundations uh, here locally as well as uh, throughout the state of Georgia. Uh, you're coming together collaboratively. You know, each of you all have, have said that there is something important about making some investments in a new and different way. And so my question to you is, what is your biggest hope that will come out of uh, this, this effort? Um, and what do you hope it can grow into beyond this initial phase? My biggest hope is that we will see new people within the state of Georgia understand that they have a place in solving the climate crisis, that we need them, that they can be just the champions that we've been desperate for to address these challenges. It's, it's the central thesis behind what Drawdown Georgia is intended to be, a movement. What mm -hmm. if the state of Georgia had a widespread movement in favor of climate solutions? We need everybody, and therefore we need everybody. And that's what I hope this can begin to do, is to tap into organizations who have long been doing such important work, but who maybe have not felt like they've been given a meaningful place at the environmental or the climate table, who aren't feeling like they can even speak to those issues because they're drowning under the challenges of meeting the day-to-day -day needs that Nathaniel has spoken about. If we can help solve those challenges through the process of scaling climate solutions, bringing solutions that we know work to these communities, if we can do that successfully, that's my biggest hope. And so it therefore needs to be something that goes beyond, that has staying power, that is more than just the coconut water that Nathaniel spoke to. And so it needs to be something that others come to join us in and that we, our foundations, remain engaged in. So one of the things that I've been grateful to our other peer funders in this work is how thoughtful the process has been. At the beginning, I only had in my mind that there were equitable outcomes that we wanted to come from this. And it's been through collaborating with them and through the guidance of a consultant, Chandra Pope, with the Rooted Group, I've come to see the importance of the equity side of the process. Mm -hmm. Because not just giving dollars matters, how you give those matters, how you listen to others. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel so well speaks to not what will you give? What will you give up? Well, for philanthropy, what we need to give up is power and pride. And maybe, maybe this can be a step in that direction for the Ray C. Anderson Foundation. And in many respects, I look to these other funders with gratitude because I see that they, in many respects, are further along in that journey of giving up this power and pride piece that's so important for our sector. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really thoughtful uh, response as well. And um, it's, it's really encouraging to hear you um, share about this. And it's, it's really encouraging to know that, um, again, that, uh, that you're not the lone one, that there are some others who um, think that it's important to invest in this work as well. So just to repeat, for those who are in the room, if you have a question, there are mics on either side of the room, so feel free to, to get up and ask your question, and hopefully our tech challenges will be worked out. Don't be shy. Maybe for some of this, this is uh, one of the first times we've been back in, know, in kind right? of a in-person space, but okay, I see some folks. Go ahead, I'll please, sir. question. Um, my name's Ed Outlaw. Someone mentioned earlier that um, Atlanta is perhaps 
the place where more has been done uh, with regard to racial justice and economic justice and anywhere else. But uh, Atlanta is also on the list of one of the cities with the highest level of inequality. Um, and I wonder, what is it about Atlanta uh, what, as we compare to other cities, and what can we be doing better? Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to be good today. So, so, so there, there are a couple of things. I think that a lot of this started with the burning of Atlanta. Um, and um, people like Henry Grady, um, who focused a great deal on his idea of the New South. Um, uh, 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 on the front end, you know, after Reconstruction, this story that was told that Atlanta was different now since it got burned down. Um, um, and that industry from the North, please come help us rebuild. Um, we're treating black people like human beings now. Um, and we've learned a lot. And so that has really been the culture of Atlanta for a long time. It's shifted from the New South to the Atlanta way, right? A, a way that has been really focused on selling, more marketing than meaning. And, and, and the challenge a lot of times is that, and, and I know Reverend Durley is frustrated about this too, is that we, we love to invoke the name of Dr. King uh, we love to invoke the name of Joseph Eccles Lowry or, or James Orange or all of these people who, who, who poured into me and, and poured into Reverend Durley, but we're not really willing to live their values. And I think one of the other big challenges is that philanthropy, in many ways, has been a part of the problem. Um, and that they have been very strategic about what they funded over the years, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times, the funds have not gone to organizations that have been courageous, or organizations that are working to build power in community, so community voices can speak for themselves. Um, they, they can, you know, I, I call it the, the Peter Pan syndrome. They give organizations just enough money to survive, but not grow. Um, and so that is why I am really excited, because I think we're at this moment now um, in Atlanta where we can potentially break through that the, the civic culture of Atlanta that has been more committed to saving face than saving children. Um, and, and I think that we're moving in that direction. Um, you know, as, as the Partnership for Southern Equity, we have worked really hard around that issue around uh, income inequality. Um, and other key issues that we're at the top of the, of the list for. Um, and, and as we go down, and, and this is what I want to be clear about too, for the people who are focused on that income inequality um, number, the reason why that number is, is lowering is not because we're getting better. It, it's really because the folks that are on the, other end, at the far end of the spectrum are getting pushed out of this city. We have more poor folks now in the suburbs than in the city of Atlanta because they've been pushed out um, as a result of the market shifts and changes. So, so to answer your question in a nutshell, and I had to tell that story because for the people who are not from Atlanta, you know, they may not understand that this has been a long story and a long history of, of, of us having these challenges. But I think with, with, with leadership like John and other people that I, I care about in local philanthropy, uh, we have an opportunity to change. For many, many years, and Ataki will tell you, local funders did not fund the Partnership of Southern Equity at all. Um, it took years for that to happen, you know, not because we, I don't think we had a persuasive case, but because we were unapologetic about what we stood for and what we were committed to. Um, but we have to be willing to do that as well today. But I think there's a whole new generation of philanthropists that are emerging that are taking the time to really uh, not just you know, poke around the edges, but to really try their best to get to the heart of the matter. Um, and, and I'm really excited about that. But that has been the culture. But I think that there's an opportunity to um, disrupt that. Uh, but it'll take everybody, in particular you know, the philanthropic community and other civic leaders in the city.
Thank you for that. I do have a couple of questions that came from the chat that I'd like to I share because the picture. live stream will be ending soon. So if I can get those questions out of the way first and then I'll uh, go to th those of you who are standing. So this is another question for uh, you, Nathaniel, and it really kind of builds on what you were just talking about. What are the best ways to build equity into grant and project budgets to make it have real, e uh, real impact? Wow, that's, I mean, that that's a, somewhat of a complicated question. I mean, I think, I think that first and foremost, it's important for the philanthropist to actually look at the organization, right? Um, what does the board of that organization look like? Is it representative of the communities that they say they're serving? Um, there's a difference, you know, we have this whole new exciting thing about organizations that are black led or brown led or led by people of color. And I think that's a great thing. But if they're not governed in a way that's consistent with that leader's values, then you're really just doing what they used to happen in the 60s, and that was what they call window dressing, right? You're putting somebody of color in a leadership position, but, but the culture of that organization is not shifting. And I've seen that recently in Atlanta, um, in philanthropy and in other places as well, where the, the, the great leader of color has left to go to another position and the person right behind that person is someone that is not necessarily consistent with the person that left. So are we ensuring that the organizations that you're funded are governed and sent in a way that will realize equity? Are the senior leadership, um, the senior leadership of that organization representative of, of that equity commitment? I think also too in terms of a commitment to, to give more from a general operating perspective versus a programmatic perspective, right? You know, a lot of times um, people don't understand that the, 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 the opportunity to, for organizations to be flexible and nimble um, creates an opportunity for them to be, uh, to be successful in, in, for the long haul. And I think, you know, if we can move away from just giving dollars to organizations from just a programmatic perspective, um, and then also the duration of the work, right? of the funding. You know, you can't expect for a frontline organization to undo structural racism in a grant cycle. <laughs> right? Preach. It doesn't it doesn't work that way, right? <laughs> so so can we can we really be honest about the amount of time that it is going to take and, and can we begin to give multi-year grants to to organizations and trust those organizations that they're led by people that look like me. You know, that's the other big issue a lot of times. You know, and, and again, like, John knows what he got, who he got with me as a friend, right? There's a difference between white money and black money and philanthropy, right? If you look at the funding that white-led organizations receive versus black-led organizations, or organizations led by our Latino brothers and sisters or other people of color, it's usually not the same amount of investment, and usually there's a, a more scrutiny on communities of color that lead these organizations because for some reason there's an assumption that we don't know how to manage money, right? So, so we've got to undo all of that if, if we're going to move forward. And I think that the last thing is really about the fund is really developing a real and authentic relationship with the grantee. Right, you can't just be giving away money, but you have to really get in the foxhole with these organizations and really develop real and authentic relationships, you know, with with those groups. I always say, and and, and talking Reverend Durley and John have heard me say this a thousand times, that change moves at the speed of trust. Right, and it's real. Right, change moves at the speed of trust, and so you've got to create that environmental trust in a way that will create the change that you want to see. Thank you so much for that. I have one last question for John, uh, because I know the live stream yep. needs to end in just a moment. Uh, but you've talked a little bit about this already in terms of the effort that you just announced. Um, but what are some other meaningful strategies that you see that can be effective in uh, helping us to get new voices uh, to the table to have a meaningful role in defining you know, the vision for how we move forward with Drawdown Georgia? For Drawdown Georgia in general, yes, Lisa. All right. Well, that sounds good. Well, I'll, I'll answer this and then say goodbye to our friends online. So for, for the Ray C. Anderson Foundation doing this work as, as part of Drawdown Georgia, we are not Drawdown Georgia. It's not even its own organization. We intended it to be very loose 
and joinable in that respect. So one of the, the fundamental pieces of this strategy is for Drawdown Georgia to be the wind in the sails of people and organizations who've already been doing great work. Yeah. Just maybe who haven't seen themselves as part of the climate movement. That's what's amazing about 20 solutions spanning five different sectors. There's something that connects to the work that you're doing or the issues that you care about. I don't care who you are. I can find that connection point. So we hope that this overall movement is something that people feel that they find themselves in and that they find an opportunity to be a leader in. We only see the state of Georgia become a leader on climate if we build this leader full movement. That is the only way. I, don't, I think of this work as, as a room and it doesn't have one door that I need to get people to walk through. It has 100. It doesn't matter which door you're willing to walk through. As long as I get you to walk through one of them and then treat everybody who's in that room with dignity and respect, then you have become a part of this. And so that's, that's my hope that infuses every aspect of what we're doing, is that this leaderful movement can come about because of this network that we're building within our state. And I'm so grateful to everybody who's been watching online with the the Living Futures Conference. We hope you have an excellent rest of your conference. So thank you, friends. Thank you. And for those who are here, the conversation is going to continue. We still have a bit more time. Nataki, come and join us, because yes. your wisdom and brilliance needs to be right here with us. Uh, so we, we invite continued questions from our audience. Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Barclay, and I represent the National Wildlife Federation, specifically Manager of Education and Engagement. I work with the emerging leaders that Nathaniel spoke of, but I first want to thank you, John, because your organization, Ray C. Anderson, has supported our work as well. But your, court, your comment about leaders, since we work with emerging leaders from K through 12 and even college, what guidance should we give them? When I was coming up, Dr. Durley was my mentor. I wanted to go into the Peace Corps and follow in his footsteps. Didn't make it to the Peace Corps, but I went into AmeriCorps. It was clear if you wanted to lead you follow these steps. Well, today, young people, they TikTok, they Vine, they Instagram. Nathan, what would you say is, is a route that we could lead emerging leaders in to make this work effective and sustainable? Well, I, I'll tell you, we have been very committed to, to doing it as an organization. We, um, just a year ago, acquired a national organization called Youth Empowered Solutions, yes and have reimagined it as a new initiative of our organization called Yes for Equity. Um, and one of the things that we're very, very serious about doing is focusing on giving young people the tools that they need in order to be effective and successful. That real systems transformation does not happen through a TikTok or through Clubhouse or through Facebook, that it takes organizing. Um, and real, and, and work that is a true reflection of the values of the people who we need to hear from. And so for us, we don't waste a lot of time in focusing on engaging those young people and getting them to move beyond, you know, understanding what real change looks like. Um, and we actually put them in positions uh, of engagement, right? So for example, we just hired 10 youth organizers in Durham and in, 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 in Atlanta to begin the process of really organizing around the work um, and, and, and in all of the areas of PSE's engagement. The second thing that I'm really excited about, again, really, you know, because I believe that it is the work that purifies the capacity and the relationships. We recently just got a significant grant from the NBA Foundation um, to develop a, a green youth pipeline. Um, of, of so, so basically what we're trying to do in Georgia is to create a workforce development pipeline for young people. But here's the key. They're designing it and leading the pipeline. Right? So we're actually positioning them as a way to be leaders in the development of their pipeline and position them to do the training for other young people. Right? 
So really getting them involved and engaged early um, and also exposing them to our elders, I think is really, really important because I think that uh, they come in with an assumption that they can do your job tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, and we have to get them to understand that this is a marathon and not a sprint, right? And by exposing them to the people who have been at this for a while, um, it's very important to do this. Now, but there's one other key thing that we do with Yes for Equity, and I think it's also really important. We cannot assume that as adults that we're positioned to be the best allies for young people, right? So there are a lot of challenges around ageism and other issues. So it's also about doing your due diligence with your adult staff to ensure that they're not bringing a level of ageism. Like, so it, what are you doing to position your adult, older staff to be partners and advocates for young leadership, youth leadership. So we do a lot of work around that as, as well. And we can talk offline about some other things, but, but for me, and I, I think it's also, you gotta be honest with, with your young leaders. Like, you know, you may wanna make $100,000 a year at 22, but you know, this is the wrong job for you if you think that that is gonna happen, right? I, I think that we, we, we're not honest with, with them in terms of what the journey really looks like if you're really committed to the work of liberation. And I think we're doing a disservice to them by, by not being honest. Um, because you know if we're not giving them the tools in order to fight the good fight, then who are we gonna leave this work behind to, right? So, so those are just some things to think about and, um, and I'll definitely be more than happy to talk to you offline about it, but I, I really appreciate your question. Well, I want to bring Nataki into this because yes. your perspective as an educator and how young people are wrestling with these issues today is one I would welcome. Yes. <laughs> well, um, I guess what I would add, and I mean, I would really echo many of the things that Nathaniel has said, but what I have been impressed with um, as I think about these younger generations is, um, you know, for those who really are committed, uh, once they understand what the issues and challenges are, they're a lot more uncompromising mm. than some of us who are That's older. So when we talk about these issues around environment, around climate, um, to bring in issues around racial justice and equity is, is a no-brainer for the younger generation. Some people who are older are still trying to grapple with that, still trying to understand how these things work together, but the young people get it. Um, so for that, I would say that I'm kind of impressed with them. But I do think that um, it's important that we ground them um, in kind of the, not the reality of um, just kind of how difficult things are, but I think in terms of being honest, um, to your point, you know, let's be honest about the struggles and challenges that we've had um, and really work with them to build those solutions, you know, for how we break through, how we, you know, uh, really address some of these barriers. But we also have to ground them with the skills that they need. Um, and, and that's critical, um, you know, having the skills, you know, the necessary skills. Because sometimes there's some things that, you know, sometimes young people say, oh, we don't even need that. You know, why, you know, why is this even a part of the curriculum or a part of this training or workshop? And, you know, as visionary as I see some young people being, I think sometimes they miss, you know, some of those fundamental things that are needed. Um, and even just understanding, you know, the tactics that have been used in the past. Um, you know, I, I used to hear, although I think it's changing, and I, I feel like the, the events of 2020 um, that kind of put this racial injustice, you know, on a large scale kind of changed some things. Uh, even for young people who used to talk about, oh, you know, the marching, the protesting, you know, we're not getting anything done with that. Um, but now I feel like they're, you know, c coming back to some of those tactics and strategies in addition to working on action plans, um, working on, you know, ways that we can change policy. Um, so those skills, I think, are important. That intergenerational dialogue is still really important. Um, you know, being able to learn from our elders um, is, is critical. Um, and I think the, the learning goes both ways. You know, it sharpens everybody who's at the table. Um, so I, that, that's what I say. Please. Thank you. And, and I'll be quick because I know the food's coming out. Uh, Miguel Granja from uh, ATDC and Georgia Tech. Um, I just had a real quick question. And it's something about the chicken and the egg situation when it comes to, when it comes to workforce development. 
Um, there's such a great opportunity, in particular for equitable workforce development with green jobs. And we know some of these jobs can really be the types of jobs that can open up to communities of color. Um, but at the same time, there's this risk that you know somebody invests and trains and does that, and there isn't a job there yet because those jobs haven't quite scaled up to meet that demand. It, it, it's a tricky situation. I was wondering if, you know, especially from a philanthropic standpoint and from, a, and from an advocacy standpoint, what can be done and, and what is being done there on the fronts? Thank you. I don't want to speak first on this. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> to me, it's perhaps uh, best to take this broader question that you have around uh, chicken and egg, which I think applies in many respects on the challenges that we're trying to solve. But in workforce development, while it's not necessarily a narrow focus of our philanthropic work, our collaborations with partners who touch on this issue, things are changing so fast that I think there is value in making sure that people are being trained on how to be nimble and responsive. When I, reflecting on my own experience, when I had my own formal education in sustainability, it was in 2014, I'm an attorney by trade. In many respects, I think I'm unlearning what I, I learned in law school to do this work. Uh, but I had to go and learn how to understand the principles of sustainable management. I was fortunate to study under Paul Hawken at the Presidio Graduate School. And the enduring lesson that I took away from that class is that you have to think about sustainability challenges in system. It is a systems thinking problem. And so they didn't try to teach us skills and strategies with any particular narrow focus. They said, let's teach you how to be systems thinkers, mm -hmm. to understand the problem and the whole. Because when you have a tricky chicken and egg sort of challenge, if you're able, not always, but often, to zoom out and think about the system in which they operate and understand the linkage points and the leverage points to create change, you may be able to flip that problem entirely and see progress happen at the exact same time. So it's, for me, fundamentally about we need a next generation of problem solvers to come at this work with as many tools in their toolbox as possible equipped as the systems thinkers. Yeah, I also think that we, we can't turn away from the role of government, right, in, in creating opportunities for large-scale engagement. To me, there's only one thing that's worse um, than preparing a workforce for an opportunity that has come yet, and that is training workers for an economy that we're about to transition from. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that is the worst, that is a, that is a, wor that is a a more horrible crime to train people for an economy that won't exist. So how can we begin to, you know, when I look at workforce development, I look at it as a continuum, right? And so, yes, there's the work around training, but then there's the work of the advocate, right, around creating policies and advancing policies that will create that demand. And I think that Opportunities like Drawdown Georgia, the Just Energy Circle, um, the group that we lead at PSC and others, to really kind of work along that continuum of, of inclusion and economic opportunity, you know, provides a great chance for us to not only focus on training folks, because again, if you look at the folks that are being trained now and the folks that have the businesses, it, it is not diverse at all. That's one of the reasons why we propose to the NBA that We've got to find a way to diversify that pipeline now, right? Um, but also, too, we have to be willing to fight for those opportunities like Build Back Better and other opportunities that we have, the Justice 40 um, executive order by Biden and, and, and other local opportunities, you know, the, the climate um, action plan of the city of Atlanta and, and, and the build, Better Buildings Challenge, you know, continuing to institutionalize those opportunities and, and really begin to look for ways that we can create these opportunities for people to be trained while at the same time be prepared for this new economy. That was one of the reasons why, which I think, and thank you, is a great segue into um, a question that I wanted to ask you, Nataki, about the Resilience Hub. 
um, that we're partnering on in the Atlanta University Center, which to me creates a great opportunity for um, the demand as well as the supply to be realized. And I, I, I wanted to just give you uh, some space to really talk about our, the work of the Resilience Hub and, and what we're doing in, in the Atlanta University Center through, through Spelman's leadership and, and our I don't know, hanging out with y'all. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And while I'm not a leader of this initiative, um, I'm really excited about this Resilience Hub um, and just the collaboration that is coming together with the Atlanta University Schools, um, with PSC, um, with others. Um, we have a set of uh, energy equity fellows, uh, students who are really digging into this issue from a curricular standpoint, who are getting training, uh, who are uh, going to be uh, engaged in some internship projects. Uh, we have new courses that have started focused on sustainable energy. Um, we're looking at uh, really launching a microgrid. I mean, so yeah. there are lots of things that are, that are happening. Um, and our students will be at the forefront uh, of this work from a training perspective. Um, but we also are tapping into the expertise of our uh, faculty across the um, Atlanta University Center institutions to really push this forward as well. And the collaboration, I think, is really beautiful um, mm -hmm. to have uh, groups like PSC and to have, you know, sort of a son of Morehouse, um, you know, at the table for this initiative. Um, so it's definitely something to look out for, um, definitely something that, um, you know, in uh, future years, I think, will um, will reach really great potential. And, and there has been a lot of work happening in pockets uh, prior to now. Uh, Spellman definitely was you know, the first uh, HBCU to, uh, to open a green dorm. Um, since we opened that dorm several years ago, and I can't remember what year it was, at each renovation project that we have on campus or any new building has been built at least to lead silver standards. Um, we have uh, Art Frazier, who is a, an architect by training, who runs our um, facilities uh, program as well as uh, he's co-chair of Sustainable Spelman. So we have him from the facility side. Dr. Fatima Shafi from the um, faculty side is also the other co-chair of Sustainable Spelman. And so we've been working for years really trying to uh, green the operations of the institution. Um, students worked years ago to get a green fee instituted um, first, you know, for an HBCU to happen as well. Um, and we've been uh, working with uh, other organizations like EcoAction um, that got together with Morehouse, with Spelman, with the Interdenominational Theological Center to really look at stormwater issues across these campuses, how stormwater is gen being generated, how it's impacting uh, communities on the west side and to look for those types of solutions. So all of this type of thing is weaved into this um, to, to this idea of building out this resilience hub in the Atlanta University Center. So thank and, you for and, that. And here's the beauty. I mean, we have HBCUs all around the state of Georgia, right, that have, not, have been untapped opportunities for not just workforce development, but also these resilient hubs and also the work that is required around energy efficiency and retrofitting. So, so there's, there is an economic opportunity um, if we're willing to see it and also if we're willing to fight for it at the legislature, right, which, which is the other thing. Um, but, but I definitely wanted to make sure we talked about that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is uh, Rachel Usher, and I really appreciate, Nathaniel, your comments earlier about the history of Atlanta, where we've been, how it shapes where we're going in the future. We're, we're all in Georgia, we're sitting looking at a November that's gonna be quite monumental for our state in shaping the future and what an equitable future looks like here in Georgia. Voting rights are under attack, reproductive rights are under attack. How can the climate community writ large contribute meaningfully in the very short term to this conversation that's really pressing and looking at our state? Thank you. Well, I, I think the first thing is that the, the climate community, um, in particular, um, the more established aspects of the community have to be willing to embrace that they've been a part of the problem. Um, that, that they, because they've been so uh, adamant about keeping their circle close and, 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 and that only a certain group of folks should be a part of the conversation, it's minimized their ability to be impactful and influential, right? So it's going to be really important for them to humble themselves and admit the, the, that they were a part of the problem. 
And, and once they're able to do that, they need to go out into the community and ask for the forgiveness of the communities that they have uh, left behind as it relates to this climate conversation. That creates an opportunity for dialogue, which then begins a real conversation about what are the strategies that we can do together to move forward, right? So, so there are a lot of lessons that we all can learn from each other, but first we have to create a table that's broad enough for everyone. And one of, one of the aspects of that table, which I think is really critical and important, is that the work has to be intersectional, right? That, that we can't just focus on climate solutions and energy challenges without also focusing on issues associated with health. We, we have to meet the folks where they are um, and um, work to ensure that we're always creating a table that is sophisticated enough to understand how all of these dots are connected, right? Um, and you know that is why when I when I started this conversation, if we're going to talk about a clean energy of future, you got to start with slavery. I mean, you've got to, right? Whether people want to understand it or not, because that energy was used to grow this economy before fossil fuels, right? Um, so, so it's, it's, about, it's about creating those conversations. How are you engaging the affordable housing community? How are we engaging the health equity community, the economic, because they all have a part to play. And if we can create that table in a real and authentic way, um, which, is, which is some of the work, again, not, not really trying to, to make a commercial, but just so thankful that, that the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance has been a part of, of, of the work that we've been doing. It's about six years now with the Just Energy Circle, like trying to create a space for diverse voices to come together around this issue. Um, but I really think that it has to, you know, equity starts inside first, right? Because, because at the end of the day, it's not just a, a what, but a way, right? And if you're willing to embrace the, the way of equity, then you have to start with a conversation about repair and healing. You have to. And then that creates the opportunity for people to work together in a different way. Um, but, but I think that we're finally getting to that point. I mean, I'm extremely optimistic about it, but, but, but if we're not careful, I've seen it so many times, we're gonna go back to the way things were if we don't take advantage of this moment. So the, that, that would be my, my thoughts and recommendation. So I know y'all hear bottles popping. We're getting there. I know, I, I know, we'll do, celebration right I know, now. we'll do two more questions. I'm gonna selfishly take the first one and then let you have our last one here. And, and Ataki, it's, it's for your perspectives with the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. What does progress look like? Are you seeing it? What does it look like mm. when things are getting better? Mm. Good question, good question. Um, so from my, from my vantage point, um, as a part of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, um, from the beginning, we have been about working uh, hand in hand with community residents uh, in West Side communities. And we do our work through a watershed lens. So the Proctor, Utoy, and Sandy Creek watersheds, this is most of Northwest and Southwest Atlanta. And really progress you know, means you know, seeing strong and equitable environmental protections you know, for our communities. It really means having people, um, making sure that people have a voice at decision-making tables. That's critical because we got our start because there were some projects happening uh, in Southwest Atlanta communities in particular that didn't have, you know, community engagement. There were things that, you know, our local government was going to push through and even the city council person from the area was not clear on those projects that could have had a negative effect environmentally and health-wise on the community. And so when community residents found out about it, um, you know, some of our elders, um, you know, uh, Reverend uh, Richard Bright and others really, you know, led this movement to stop um, some of this work, and I know Reverend Durley is shaking his head because he, you know, remembers that, you know, we had issues around sewers uh, and around the building of uh, basically sewage overflow facilities in community parks uh, in southwest Atlanta. And so when I think about that progress, it means that people, you know, have a more meaningful voice in decision making. Uh, it means that we are investing in leadership development. 
um, you know, one of the programs that Wawa is working on with EcoAction is something called the Atlanta Watershed um, Learning Network um, that trains local residents um, to, you know, really seek out and to try to advance solutions around things like green infrastructure. Um, and, you know, while um, I'm not saying anything about, you know, some of the, the leaders who, um, you know, have been in our community for a long time, one of our graduates, Jason Dozier, is now on the Atlanta City Council. Uh, he helped to start, you know, um, the Entrenchment Creek Community Stewardship Council. And so he's taking that work and moving it forward. So I think that kind of speaks to the um, to the, the benefit of this leadership development that Nathaniel was talking about. Um, so it, it's all of that, um, but it's also just making sure that as um, Atlanta is growing and developing, um, that communities are not forgotten, are not left behind. Bless you, bless you, bless you, <laughs> Reverend Durley. Um, and you know there are a lot of investments that are now happening on the west side, and I think you know many of us look at those things with wonder and excitement, but I can't help but be concerned about those people who have asked for these solutions right. to be implemented, who have worked for these solutions to be implemented, but if we don't have the right su policy supports in place, if we're not wa working across sectors, then the park that's built or the this or that that's built um, you know, can end up displacing people, you know, if we're not bringing the housing folks and the, you know, the watershed people and all of these different entities together. And so progress looks like making sure that we have these tables um, where we have these, you know, um, where we're busting through these silos, um, where, you know, there's even some shared governance, right, with, with communities. Uh, and I know uh, Mayor Dickens is looking at things like participatory budgeting and stuff like that. So that, that's the type of stuff that we need to really see the progress. Um, because the progress is happening, but we got to make sure that those who have fought for this progress get a chance to benefit from it in place and are not displaced and moved away from it. That's right. Brilliant. Thank you. Please. Thank you. My name is Reverend Jenny Phillips. I work with Global Ministries, which is the humanitarian development arm of the United Methodist Church. I'm so grateful for this conversation. Um, I came in here this afternoon with women on my mind mm -hmm. because of the headlines of the day and feel a heightened awareness of something that was briefly mentioned that women of color, that people of color experience the deepest burdens of the climate, climate crisis, but in particular women of color. And so I'd love to hear more about how Drawdown Georgia is very specifically and intentionally drawing in the wisdom of women of color as it seeks mm -hmm. solutions. We have more work to do, but it's <laughs> wonderful that we have people like Nataki here doing this work. Um, my, my hope is that this whole theory of change uh, of building this movement is one that people see as led by women, and in particular by women of color. If we can do that here, there's so much strength and wisdom that we need to be lifting up for the benefit of all of us. So I want to hear your perspectives <laughs> on how we can have more Natakis elevated in this space. Well, I mean, we just say the word and we can make it happen for <laughs> sure. Um, you know, let's put the resources out there um, because, you know, women and, and this is kind of interesting because I've been doing an unofficial sort of study for the last for several years now, um, really looking at the work that women of color across this country are doing in the environmental space, particularly in terms of environmental justice. And increasingly, that means that women are women of color are lifting up this banner of climate justice. And they are in every community across this country. They are leading these efforts. Not that the men aren't there, um, but, but women definitely have you know, been the caretakers of home and family. When we talk about the health impacts, they are seeing it. They are experiencing it. They are caring for children, caring for the elderly. And, and the impacts are very clear. Um, so I think we've got to just, um, you know, really do more to, you know, make sure that those doors are accessible um, and that people know that those doors exist to walk through. There are lots of groups, lots of organizations. Uh, I know uh, Valerie uh, Rawls um, has the Eco Womanist Institute that is focusing specific, specifically on women of color um, in, in this work. Um, so that's a group that we need to have uh, connected. 
um, people like Felicia Davis, who've okay. been working on you know green stuff forever and a day, as well as you know women's empowerment, voter rights, um, you know all of that. Um, Helen Butler with the uh, Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda. I could just run down right. this list right. of women who get it uh, and who are you know really trying to do this work and bring together these issues around climate, you know, with these other broader issues. Um, that have you know the same genesis you know when we talk about many of the the, the challenges um, as, as Nathaniel so really eloquently laid out um, so we've got to reach out we've got to you know open up these spaces you know to those women to these organizations that they are working in and leading um, and we can you know we can we can we can broaden this you know really quickly um, but we've got to see the value and thank you for that question. Um, thank you really for elevating that wisdom, you know, the power of, of women of color, um, of black women. Um, and, and when we talk, I mean, really, let me just also just make this one last point. When we talk about um, these issues, you know, from a climate perspective, when we talk about policy, um, look at the records. Look at the records of women of color, of black women uh, in Congress and legislatures across this country and how they are pushing these environmental issues forward. Um, you don't see any greater champions. Um, so we've got to make sure that these women are at the table, that our organizations are resourced to continue to do this work around organizing, um, around mobilizing, and the education that needs to happen to help us move toward the solutions that we need to implement. Yeah, and, and as men, we have to be committed to that, right? As I said before, you know, equity is a way. Um, and it's not just about supporting organizations that are led by women of color and black women. It's also that it's our responsibility to create spaces for them to be seen fully and completely as the leaders and change agents that they are. So for example, at, at PSC and Ataki knows this, 80% of my staff are black women. Um, that wasn't by happenstance, that was intentional. Um, our just energy portfolio has been primarily led by black women. Um, so, so again, it's, it's more than a notion and it goes back to this deep commitment, right, to making sure that we create these spaces for all of us to show up for humanity in the way that, they, that we've been called to do. Um, and, 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 it, and, it, and it means that we have to understand our shortcomings and also be willing to create spaces for people to reach their full potential. Um, and, and so it's not just about supporting organizations, which we need to, but we have to make a commitment, leaders of organizations that are fairly large, are we creating the spaces for black women to thrive? Are we creating spaces for women of color to thrive? And that's been my personal commitment because so many women played a part in who I am, black women in particular, that that, that has been my personal charge and commitment to, to do that, so. Well, my deep gratitude for you all being here we want the conversation to continue amongst all of us in community. So please, we hope you enjoy these, the drinks and the food that's provided and, and we'll look forward to chatting more with you. Thank you all so much. For your